good morning. My name is Atul Jitnis, and um, as you can see, I'm neither lean nor agile. In fact, um, <coughs> I ask myself what I'm doing over here until I realize that most uh, development, uh, everyone here is talking about development of uh, software or products of some sort, and the end result is a product, and that I may be neither lean nor agile, nor am I actually a developer anymore. Uh, but that is something I know a little bit about, especially here in India, and that's what I'm going to be talking about for the next hour or so. So the first thing you should know is I don't write code. I absolutely haven't written any code since maybe the mid-1990s. The reason is uh, because I don't write code, uh, I write people. Uh, which does not necessarily mean that I give people, uh, go around telling people the meaning of life and things like that. Uh, instead, what I do is I mentor uh, uh, people, especially developers, uh, when they want to develop something or the other, especially products which are supposed to go out into the mass market. Um, what I'm going to be doing uh, today is I'm going to take you through a brief history of uh, uh, the, uh, the product market as I have perceived it over the past uh, few years, uh, look at the current state and uh, look at what needs to be done. Now, why am I doing this? The reason why I'm doing this is because some of you will have noticed, in fact, many people have have noticed, there, are, there aren't really too many products coming out of India. Now, one thing up front, uh, especially because I see a lot of people who are from outside India, let me make it clear that my focus is on India. I specifically focus on developers uh, in India uh, who, uh, who want to develop products and tackle both the Indian as well as the international markets. So let me talk about the early days. Why am I qualified to um, talk about this at all? The reason is because India has gone through various phases as far as product development is concerned. And these phases have unfortunately not always been positive. There have been negative phases as well. In fact, we are just coming out of a negative uh, phase. But there was a very strong uh, uh, phase, um, a positive phase, which was in the mid-1980s. This is about the time when I got started on this. I came to Bangalore in 1986, and uh, as usual, you know, a young graduate started looking for things to do. And one of the things that I wanted to do very badly was develop software products. Uh, the problem was you have to understand what India was like in the 1980s. Software was not something people bought. Software was something that people got along with their hardware. And it was really a shame that when you try to create a piece of software and try to sell it to someone, they say, why should I pay money for software? It's really discouraging, especially if you're a product uh, developer. Um, so we decided to take an approach that was uh, slightly different from what you would have expected. This next photograph is going to take at least one person in the room slightly off uh, by surprise. So this is us in 1987. And you will notice that there are posters hanging behind there um, talking about each of our little products. There's some more on this side. That's my wife. We had just gotten married uh, that year. And there's about half of me on the right side. And my uh, partners at that time, partners and my mentors, I was very lucky to have uh, really good people working with me all the time. The one thing that we realized is what we needed very badly is exposure. We needed people to not only want to use our products, but we needed people to know about us in first place. Okay, and then be willing to spend you know, whatever money we were asking for uh, our products. You can see we were very customer oriented, like you can see the post over there which says we are not number one. And below that it says our customers are. So 
very Apple style uh, approach long before uh, Apple came into the picture. But what was important and what was the, I would call, the stunt that we had to pull to get people to even want to use our software was that we decided to take each of these packages, price them at 100 rupees, which was at that time something like about $10, and uh, put them on a single diskette, manual, with a printed manual uh, yeah, along with that. And our catchphrase was that if you cannot afford to buy our software, you're either completely broke or a total criminal. Surprisingly, this worked. And uh, this is uh, the stall that you see over there was uh, at an exhibition that took place in the Taj Hotel uh, nearby. And we couldn't keep up with people wanting to buy our software, which was a really weird kind of situation, like I had described. People weren't buying software in those days. But um, they wanted to buy our software. And then companies started ordering. You know, we got one order from, I remember this. I get a letter uh, sitting in the office. I open that letter, and it's a purchase order for 500 copies of each of our uh, pieces of software from a company in Goa. Uh, that was mind-boggling. You know, we probably spent more money on replacing floppy disk drives for copying those Soft, uh, yeah, you know, software packages onto the floppies than we were making in the bargain. But that wasn't important. Important for us was people wanted our software. And more important, they wanted our software. We were clearly an Indian company. And it, it really worked out uh, well. If it wouldn't have happened, what we did at that time wouldn't have worked, a lot of us would have been in a very different uh, situation uh, today. I probably... <coughs> wouldn't be so lean and agile as I am now. But uh, it gave us an uh, you know, encouragement. It gave us what we needed to do to move on to, <clears throat> to uh, 1989. In 1989, we, were, we had now more packages. We're selling more packages. And it was really great. And you know how people were picking up. We were, banks were picking up our packages by, you know, by the hundreds. Uh, people were constantly sending in orders. Uh, we weren't really making that much money yet. When in 1989, we participated in another exhibition, which was, at that time, the biggest computer-oriented uh, exhibition that took place in India, which called the Computer Society of India Annual uh, Expo, which was that year in Bangalore. And uh, we took a stall. We took two stalls, actually. And we were showing our stuff over there. Now, one problem that we, were ha we had at that uh, time was that uh, we, we needed to um, gather information. As we were gathering information, market information, people coming in, putting in inquiries and all that, we really didn't want to have somebody sit over there and then you know, uh, uh, type in all the stuff or uh, you know, take the visiting cards or get people to write in the address book and all that. So we had a machine in the corner where people would go and either type in their requirement, quickly put in their stuff. In those days, hardly anyone had an email address. Uh, I think in the entire exhibition, I was the only person who had an email address at that time. So no, we didn't ask people for their email addresses, but we did ask them for their telephone numbers, fax numbers, things like that. They would type all that stuff in. And then somebody comes to me and asks, how are you doing this? What, what are you doing? What's happening to this data? So uh, is it all going onto the disk over there? And we said, no, I mean, there's a telephone line over here. And uh, we have got a system running in the office. And, and what's happening in the office is, I mean, you're actually connected to our office over there. And we are, you know, as you're typing in the stuff over there, it gets saved over there. What we had running over there was what was known popularly in those days as a BBS. Now, we didn't think that much of it. It was a necessity. We required it. We needed it. And this is where you have an example how what you thought would happen is not really what would happen. We finished the exhibition on, uh, on the fifth day. It was a five-day long exhibition. And we were pretty dead by the end of that. And uh, the next day morning, we come to the office. 
Outside our office door was um, a gentleman. He was, we were on the first floor. He was sitting on the step, uh, steps. Baldish gentleman, he was a bit confused and what was he doing over there, but clearly somebody who was from the, you know, from the enterprise uh, side of life. And he said, are you the constellation guys? Yeah. Uh, you were doing something at the exhibition over the past five days, and we want that. So I asked, uh, what is it? From, what is this about? Turns out this gentleman was from a company called ABB, the, one of the largest electrical equipment giants worldwide. And they had a problem. They had dealers all over the world, distributors, but those people were all electronically connected. But in India, there were two things that they didn't have. Functional telephone lines and any system that was available locally that could allow their distributors and dealers in India to connect back to ABB, put in orders or get information that they required, do database searches, catalog searches and things like that. That's what they wanted. And uh, what our little system was called CIX, which was called at that the Cyber Information Exchange, big name, whatever. It was called uh, BBS. And uh, we said, uh, well, yeah, we have that system. He said, will you sell it to us? And you know something? We didn't realize that we had a product on our hands. Because that software that was running over there was something we had developed in-house for ourselves, because we needed it. But we never realized that somebody else would need it as well. That, what happened that morning, changed our lives completely. So by 1990, which was literally a, a month later, this exhibition was in November uh, 1989, and a month later, um, we, we had an agreement with uh, ABB to set up their stuff. What we didn't have was a name, so we gave it a name, and we called it Cybernet. And uh, it had a nice big fat manual, it had user guides, you know, for the local uh, system operator as well as for the remote users and all that. And we figured out that they needed a lot more than just the software, but then the hardware was missing, and they needed modems, and then uh, the telephone lines went really up to scratch over here. I mean, people used to laugh when we used to say, Oh, uh, we are doing stuff over Indian telephone lines. They said you can't hold a proper telephone conversation over Indian telephone lines. What are you going to do sending data? But things were changing. Technology was changing in those days, and you were getting error correcting modems, and a lot of stuff was uh, yeah, happening at that time, which made this feasible. Over the next few years, we, um, we were supplying software to virtually every single large company in the country. Whether you're talking about ABB, who was our first guy, uh, amalgamated uh, uh, ACC, uh, the largest uh, cement producer in the country, CyberMedia, the largest, uh, you know, the people who produce DataQuest, etc. Stock exchanges, Indian Aluminium, there was a huge long list. And what that experience taught us was there's a market everywhere. And people were willing to pay for products as long as those products did what you, you know, solved the problem for them. Now, over the, uh, during that time, we weren't the only ones who were producing products and who were trying to crack into the product market. One other uh, company, actually there were two other companies whom you may have known, uh, heard of before, and uh, one of them was a company called Tally. Bharat Goenka, um, who had a very similar situation, developed uh, an accounting system for a client who needed something in Calcutta. And the way he created that product, he suddenly found a lot of people wanting to do precisely the same thing that he had done over there. And he, what was earlier known as PFA, the Putronics Financial Accountant, became Tally, India's best selling product to this day. I mean, this product ha doesn't have any competition in India. And now it's, well, you know, it's being sold in the UK and South Africa and in various uh, places. It had all sorts of things that people had never seen before. 
you didn't have to remember any codes, you didn't have to uh, do anything. You could just type out in plain English what it was, oh, uh, uh, 5,000 rupees towards, et cetera, et cetera. You just type it out in plain English and the system would figure out what needed to be done. He did this, he had created this, because there was a need for it, because his client in Calcutta didn't have trained computer people over there. They could type, they could speak English, but they weren't going to be sitting down and learning codes and, uh, you know, C3000, A512, 5000, slash, 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 you know, that's how accounting systems used to run in those days. So he had to find a way in which people could use his software without having to learn something that would put them off completely. And that's how Tally was created. On the other side of the spectrum, we, there was a company uh, called Knoxware. They did something uh, that, uh, that was rather amazing. If you look at the time of uh, the 1990s, it is famous for something else as well. It's famous for the concept of computer viruses. Now, um, a lot of people came up with, uh, I think, and most of these viruses, what they used to do, they used to go and sit right at the boot sector of the, the machine, and that was the end of it. I mean, uh, you boot up the machine and you are infected. And uh, after that, the virus could do whatever. You shove in a floppy or you had another disk or you connect it to anything, it would go and infect uh, the other machines as well. Knoxware faced exactly the same problem. Now, they were doing something else uh, at that time. They were uh, the IT division of uh, another company, uh, but they needed to protect themselves. So they came up with a completely different solution. Lots of us have heard about the concept of antivirus software, which is still you know, being used uh, today and slowing down machines all over the world. But what, Nox what Knoxware did is they realized that since most of the uh, viruses used to go and sit in the boot sector and affect the boot sector, you had to be able to protect the machine before it even boots. So what Knoxware did is they created an add-on card with a ROM on it and with some software on it which would be invoked before the machine booted. Now again, this was something they had done for themselves. But I was a personal witness to see how that thing, you know, it was such a problem for people. Just, there, was, there was no such thing as an uninfected PC anymore, anywhere in India, especially with the amount of pirated software that's going around. And when they came up with the solution that worked, it didn't slow down the machine, it would just sit over there, but every time a virus would try to go and, uh, you know, infect a boot sector or install itself, it was there to you know, stop the thing and make sure it didn't happen. These people started, uh, you know, there was a huge demand for this, and people started asking for these cards called the Knox card in such great quantities that this company couldn't keep up with the demand. In fact, at one point, they almost went bankrupt for the simple reason they couldn't produce their, soft, their, their product fast enough. Now, again, remember, this is a time when people still weren't buying software. Now, you remember the 100 rupees uh, thing that we were selling at, uh, at one time? We went from 100 rupees per um, application. The application which I talked about earlier, Cybernet, which was a corporate communications host, it went from 100 rupees to 100,000 rupees. And people were still willing to buy it. So much for the concept of people not wanting to buy software in India. Unfortunately, those were the heydays of Indian products. What we saw coming after that was a severe decline. Almost every software or technical product company in the country, except very few, like Tally, went out of business, started doing something else. And that something else was rather scary. So uh, what happened basically is that between 1995 and 2000, 2001, we had something that all of you are very familiar with. It's known as the bubble, where um, people abroad in the US, in Europe, um, suddenly saw a market uh, for technical products, technology products, which they could, you know, as long as they could produce something, they would get something known as funding. 
And funding was the big, you know, was the big game. It wasn't revenues, it was funding. And so we went through uh, the five years of 1995 to 2000, 2001, and then the bubble burst. And all of a sudden, now what, what happened in India in the meantime is everyone stopped doing what they were doing and they were catering to companies abroad because they needed to have products or needed to have something or the other and they didn't have the, uh, the wherewithal or the, you know, the, the resources abroad uh, to get the stuff done. So they were looking at uh, countries like India to get the uh, stuff done. And when the bubble burst, which was unfortunately, uh, though it's not uh, exactly because of this, but around the 9-11 time uh, in 2001, that we actually came to a situation where there suddenly wasn't any business anymore. You see, what had happened is a completely new and I would say rather ghastly thing had happened to the, uh, the concept of uh, product development in India. It had given way to something known as outsourcing. And outsourcing was the death of products in India for almost 10 years. Why? Because the Indian government decided to uh, encourage software exports. Of course, there was no software export as such. Okay, what was really happening is cheap labor. So I have friends who used to sit and they used to get instructions from their managers saying, okay, give me 600 lines of code by morning. Okay, what are the 600 lines of code supposed to do? That doesn't matter, we get paid by the line of code. Now you can, if that was the state of, of uh, you know, what developers were being exposed to at that time, you can imagine what was happening to products around here. They just nosedived and disappeared. Almost every single product company was out and was no longer doing anything. Pretty sad situation, even worse. It created something that we are feeling the repercussions of even today. You see, because outsourcing was so popular, a number of international companies started setting up their businesses or their branches here in India so that they could you know, do, uh, get stuff done under their control. The Yahoo's, um, the Amazons, just about every big name you can think of uh, came over here, including Microsoft set up in, uh, in Hyderabad, uh, Yahoo set up in Bangalore, and and they started hiring as if there was no tomorrow. They started hiring people at A, insane salaries, and B, virtually no qualifications. Because what they were doing is they were hiring fresh graduates out of college. Even, they were hiring them even while they were still in their final year of engineering. Giving them a career path which of course is always welcome. People always uh, like to earn money, especially here in India. And I remember this one time when I was in 2001, 2002, uh, my wife and I had gone to dinner at Windsor Manor. And when we stepped out, um, I went to get my car. And there were three people standing next to me, very young guys. One of them I knew, he didn't recognize me, but I knew him because I had given a talk in his college. He had just graduated the year before. So this guy goes and gets his car, a really fancy car. One of those big, you know, flashy things, fully loaded as they say. And he got in his car and waved goodbye to his friends and his friends then went and got their cars equally flashy. That was the amount of money that was going into getting people to drop everything else that they had planned for their lives and go and write code, but not create products. They would be given instructions, do this. Okay, don't ask any questions, don't ask where this code is supposed to go, what it is supposed to do, what's the big picture of things. Within the next five years, what happened 
very, very bad, sadly, is that people lost the whole idea of what a product is all about. I know. I have dealt with these people. It is one of the biggest tragedies I saw happening. India was one of the, had the largest pool of technically qualified English-speaking people in the world. And I'm talking about a pool larger than it was available in the USA or in Europe, English-speaking. Yet, there wasn't a single product being developed in the country. Every time you go and ask people, why are you wasting your time writing code for other people? Why aren't you creating something on your own? The answer would be, well, got to earn money. And anyway, we don't know anything about this product development and all that. The people abroad know better. What we saw was a development of a mindset that told these people that they don't know enough to do anything. That was really sad, because what you saw was a bunch of really talented people. And I know. I have dealt with them. I've gone and spoken at their colleges. I've gone and taught at their colleges. They, I have dealt with them in various user groups. Uh, I was very heavily involved in the free and open source software and the Linux uh, thing. And I was dealing with these people. Some of these people were really brilliant, but they would refuse to use those brains to create products. That brings us to uh, what I would call the present, which is unfortunately uh, not that much better, but things have certainly have changed uh, a lot. What happened in 2005 is that the whole concept of mobility started, you know, mobile applications. And there was suddenly a market for something that wasn't PC-oriented. What happened between the 1980s and uh, the mid 2000s was that all software development was basically PC-oriented. And that was completely ruled by the world abroad. But when it came to mobile stuff, we were in a situation that was slightly different from what people were used to in the US we leapfrogged the entire concept of mobile uh, communications. We never had an analog cellular system, for example, over here. We went directly for digital. We went from landlines, where you could barely make a phone call, never mind being able to get data across, to cellular communications on GSM within one year. Today, the concept of a landline is almost dead around here. The only reason why people still get landlines is because they want to get an internet connection, a terrestrial internet connection, ADSL or whatever. But even that is becoming a kind of a, uh, of a you know, rarity. But what came along with this entire thing was the awareness that here is a market that we understood better. It was technologies that we knew better. And there were opportunities over here that were begging to be exploited. And in 2005, I began seeing people slowly working two shifts. Daytime, working at Yahoo, Google, Amazon, whatever. And at night, sitting at home and developing mobile products. And all of a sudden, I started seeing, I was heavily involved with mobile uh, stuff already for the past five years. But and uh, in those days, I used to use um, a Palm-based uh, uh, phone, Palm OS-based phone, which had, to its distinction, uh, a lot of applications available for it. And I was surprised to find out that many of these applications were being developed, products were being developed by companies here in India. And this was something I wasn't going to let go. So I had spent the past 10 years or so um, you know, in consulting. But I always had this itch about getting back into uh, product development, which I had kind of abandoned by the mid-1990s. And I did get back into it. I joined a company at that time, which was, uh, which was developing uh, uh, products. The basic itch was I wanted to create. 
I wanted to create products. Not only did I want to create products, I wanted to see other people to do, uh, do so as well. Because I realized something over time. As people were developing each little small application, they were gaining more and more confidence. They were gaining um, you know, confidence that they could do something that other people wanted. The same kind of thing that I experienced in the late 1980s, and which completely disappeared after that. They were beginning to experience that. Today, we have got people um, sitting virtually on every corner. You can't throw a stone in Bangalore without hitting a mobile software developer. And every second one of them has got ambitions or is already in the process of creating products of their own. Now, how do you take it from there? The problem was that people had lost the art of product development. Also, there were a lot of stories that were coming in from abroad or even, even in the Indian uh, commercial markets. So I would say there is these, they had lost sight of the rules of engagement. The rules of engagements are fairly clear. Unfortunately, you'll be surprised how few people actually understand this. First of all, when you develop a product, it isn't just about you know, creating a piece of technology and dumping it out there. It's about revenues. You'll be surprised how many people disregard this completely. Oh, that's not necessary. I will be putting out my product for free, so I don't have to worry about revenues. I wonder how they plan to build, uh, do their, pay their bills. But this is the primary thing. It's about revenues. And if you're talking about revenues, it means that what I did in 1987 is still true today. You've got to reach out to your markets. You've got to have a way of reaching people so that they will want the stuff that you, want to, uh, that you are cre uh, creating. And then they will spend money on it. But a lot of people didn't know that. The other thing is, it's about use. You know, it's, it's not good enough that somebody, even if, uh, let's say he spends money and uh, you know, buys your software. Unless people use your product, it's, your product isn't going to evolve in any way because you're not going to get any feedback. If they just buy it, play around with it uh, for a little while and then uh, you know, go and do something else, it's, what you're going to end up with is a situation where people don't uh, tell you, hey, you know, this is a great product, it would be good if it, you know, it could do this, or you know, there's a bug over here, it would be great if it, this could be fixed, and, you know, that kind of feedback, which not only results in better products, but also results in encouragement. It's, uh, I would say it is not something that you can put a revenue stamp on. You can't say that you know, this, this is money in the bank, but it is money in the heart for a developer to know that someone is using your product and you know, really enjoying the use, the use of the product. And the most important part is it's about users. Unfortunately, and this is still true today, and this is 2012, a majority of the products that are being developed in India are being developed by people who understand the technology really well. I mean, really, really well. But they develop products which only they can understand. They say, it's so simple. See, you do, you do this over here, and you know, in case you can't do this, then you just go and change the XML over here, and uh, duh. When I got back into the product development game, in uh, 2005, 2006, I had to undergo a transformation which was really hard, really, really, really hard. And unfortunately, not enough people are doing that today. In 2005, I was one of those hothead techies who would, uh, you know, have an answer for everything. I was this Linux freak. Uh, I would do, uh, I had a technical answer for just about everything. What I wasn't was a typical user. And over the next three years, I had to teach myself to think like a user, to understand how users perceive a product. 
it is only then that the products that I and the company I was working for at that time uh, you know, became something that people wanted. You have to be able to think like a user. You have to understand what users want. They don't have the time or the inclination or the desire to, uh, to learn the technicalities of uh, they, whatever your software or your product is doing. They just want to get on with their job. And if it does that, they will use that software more and more and they will probably recommend it to someone. But if you expect them to become technical wizards like you, then you have a big problem because then people don't buy your software. And this is what we saw over the years. A lot of people producing products that were great functionally, but unusable. So usability and users, keeping users in mind was very, very important. Unfortunately, still not happening. One of the things that we need to desperately drive home to people is it is not about the developers, it's about users. And there's one more very important thing. It's not about funding. Now, I don't have to tell you just how uh, insane the market has been. People float a new product, come up with an idea or something or the other, and the first thing they go is look for funding. I saw yesterday in the evening, um, I saw a news, a news item that went out that such and such a company got $7.5 million in funding. Congratulations. Congratulations for what? Why were people congratulating a company that got $7.5 million in funding? That wasn't an achievement. The achievement would be if you, know, you use the $7.5 million, create something really insanely great, get lots of users to spend money on that, earn massive amount of revenues, and the people who have invested the money in yours, they have lent you the $7.5 million, Okay, they make a killing in returns. Then we can say congratulations. But uh, in this particular case, the company um, actually has a few people in it uh, whom I know. So I just got in touch with them saying, so what are you guys going to be doing with this? Oh, I don't know. Now, first of all, you've got to relax. We are finally, our ship has come home. Uh, wow. I don't see that company going very far. I think that company is going to be out of business in the next 18 months. They have no clue what they're dealing with. They think that funding is what it was all about. This is probably the most dangerous thing facing Indian product developers today. This misconception that you know it's about funding. Even worse, most uh, you know, product conferences that I attend um, are about VCs getting funding, angel funding, seed funding, then total silence when it comes to the concept of developing the product, getting it to market, marketing in it, expanding your market, iterating, iterating, iterating. All those things that make a great product, none of these conferences talk about it. The next item on the agenda after getting your funding is exit strategies. How weird can you get? This is yet another bubble. And no products are going to come out of this. So what happens is I make myself highly unpopular by you know, talking to, I, I come across a lot of young uh, software developers, a lot of product developers, and I make myself really unpopular with them by sitting down with them saying, OK, let's talk about what your product does. No, uh, we, we, you know, we, we will do about that later. That's not so important. I say, guys, you're dead. And you know, either I get chucked out of the office at that point in time, or you know, they will listen to me grudgingly. But nobody wants to hear what I have got to say, or very few people. And those few people, who, uh, few people who do listen, they are probably going to create insanely great products and push them out there. But the rest of the people are going to die. They're just going to disappear. I know this is a really hard, a harsh thing uh, to say. 
I'm not building too many fans with this, but the reality is that most of the product development that's happening in India today is not about products, but it's about funding. Go on for a while, make as much money as you can uh, get. You have your exit, if possible. If not, well, you have lived your life and let's go on to the next product idea. You know, the concept of ideas rather than, you know, everyone, it's very easy to come up with an idea. Oh, this is what this software will do or this is what this product will do. The what is not important. Anyone can come up with the what. Anyone can say, this is what software is supposed to do or this is what the idea. Oh, we will create a social network for uh, doctors, medical practitioners. So the real question they should be asking is not what, but how. If they have an answer to the how, they're getting somewhere. If they don't have an answer for the how, they're not going anywhere. Definitely not getting anywhere. Also, this insane uh, concept of piggybacking on other products. Uh, over the last six months, we saw Google terminating a huge number of their own projects. Which is their right to do. I mean, they didn't see any future for the product um, or for the service, uh, whatever. They decided to terminate it. And people were up in arms saying, but my product, my service depends on that service and now they're terminating and I'll go dead. You know this symbiosis, this piggybacking thing has gotten out of control. People need to understand that they need to build products which are self-sufficient. Which means you've got to think beyond just fancy screens and you know, uh, what button does this and what button does that, but you have to think about the back ends as well. You might start off with by using some free service, uh, some map service or whatever, but eventually you're either going to have to pay for, some, so for that service or that service might just disappear. What happens to you then? This is another thing that needs to be driven home to people around here. And finally, the most important uh, thing is I mentioned this before, so in, it's about users. It's more than that. When people develop products, especially here in India, they're dealing with a user mindset that's quite different from what they're dealing with abroad. But that doesn't change the rules. Those three rules which I said earlier, it's about revenues, it's about use, and it's about users. Those rules remain the same. However, the implementation may be different. You have to consider, for example, in India, if you create a mobile product, that your end user does not necessarily uh, have the skills to be able to use your application simply because it's written in English. We've got 26 official languages in India. Let's not get started on different dialects and whatnot. So there are issues which you need to address over there. Localization, easy localization, uh, which is very important, which too few people pay attention to. I also keep say, uh, telling people that pay attention to your local markets. Don't pay attention just, so, oh, I'm going to take this product, I'm going to sell it in the US. Most of the people don't actually have an idea what it takes to market a product in the US. I have done this and I bear scars to this day on how hard it is to market a product in the US or in Europe. Actually, it's a little easier in Europe. In the US, it's insane. Because A, you're dealing with a huge amount of competition, a huge a, a lack of awareness, which requires huge amount of marketing efforts and a marketing uh, a market spend, advertising and whatnot. It's not enough to just create a product, push it out there and say, oh, it's a great product, people will use it. Not going to happen. What I advise people to do is first become strong locally. Try to cater to your local markets because if you create a product that can easily be localized, for example, in different languages in India, and you've got lots of choices over here. That means you have a product that 
can not only sell well here in India, but is very easily adaptable to markets outside India. China is the single largest mobile market in the world. And it is growing insanely fast. That's a market you want to address, but if you, if you have an application that only works in English, you're out in the cold, that's gone. This is an example of things that people need to pay attention to today. Indian developers need to uh, pay attention to. Because if you do that, you create what is, would be a truly international product. International class, which addresses things that are unique to specific markets, to each market. I remember we, um, in 2006, we were pushing out a product called Mundu IM, which was a great success in the US and also in the UK, and completely flopped in France and Germany because the product was not localizable. It literally had to be written from scratch again, just so that you know, strings were isolated, um, you know, prompts were not hardwired into the code, and that somebody could take all the strings then and convert them into whatever language was there for the local market. I actually had to sit and do the German version of that because I speak German. Uh, we had a terrible time adapting it for the French market, and each market was a new challenge, simply because we had not thought of all these things earlier. The thing about India and products coming out of India is that we've got massive amount of scope. Labor costs, development costs in the rest of the world have gone through the roof. It's simply not possible for people to dedicate resources the way we have them over here. But the important thing for people to understand over here, to realize over here, is that we shouldn't be just developing software for someone else. It's not your product unless it carries your name and your identity along with it. Create products over here that when they go out into the market, people say, this is a product which is developed in India, is bound to be good. When we achieve that, then we have really truly arrived in the products market. India has got huge scope in that, lots of qualified people who need guidance. That guidance comes from within companies that they work for. It comes from the colleges. There's a lot of revamping that needs to be done over here to make sure that these people have their mindsets. But if it's done right, then we are not going to talk about a software superpower, which people keep talking about India, saying that India is a software superpower. Nobody cares if India is a software superpower because the piece of software that you're using in the US or in Germany or in France doesn't say made in India. It doesn't tell you that it's from India. What you want is India to be a product superpower. So people recognize that and say, this is good stuff. This is the kind of stuff that I have been pushing for. This is the kind of stuff that I, um, that I really enjoy doing. And even at my current stage, which is twice the size and age that I was when I started, the photograph that I showed you was 25 years ago. Uh, even at this age, I still get fired up every time when it comes to say, let's do this, let's, let's create this really great, insanely great product. It's possible to do that. I know it's possible to do it because I've done it before. <sighs> it's a topic I can keep talking about, and, but I'm going to be running out of time. Uh, so if you do have any uh, questions, this is the easiest way to reach me. I'm really insanely active on uh, Twitter. This is how you can uh, reach me. Uh, my website is also over there in case you want to send me an email or something, uh, uh, feel free. If you have any questions right now, by all means, uh, do ask. Uh, otherwise, I'll be around. Thank you. <laughs>